Hi, and welcome to Local Connection. Today we're playing tourists in our own city, starting in the heart of downtown at Robson Square. Join us as we explore some of Vancouver's well-known landmarks and hidden gems and rediscover what makes our city so amazing. On today's show, we'll try to decipher if Father Winter has pulled a fast one on our suffering ski season. The natural snowfall, it's been dry. We haven't had it, and we're obviously getting it right now, so it's great. We shine a light on a disease affecting the family of a CFL athlete. The first time I really learned more about what MS was was when they sent the home nurse to start teaching my mom how to do her own injections. And satisfy our sweet tooth for a good cause. Oh my God, that's so good. See all this and more right now on Local Connection. Hi, and welcome to Local Connection, the show about the people and places that make Vancouver great. I'm Sean Ayers. And I'm Stephanie Florian. Sean and I are starting with a winter tradition and a Vancouver classic. We've laced up and we're gonna go for a skate at Robson Square Ice Rink. Now it might be nice and cold here, but we're gonna take you up to Cypress Mountain and see if they've finally gotten any snow. Not before I see some more of those fancy moves, Sean. Oh, absolutely. Despite promising pre-season snow predictions, our poor local mountains have suffered a rough start. Just have a look at the grass poking through. We've had a lower than average snowfall, so is there any hope for the rest of the season? Today we're on Cypress Mountain to talk to industry experts about the current state of our snow situation. It's going to take a lot more than just one good snowfall to turn our season around. Joffrey Komen, Director of Sales and Marketing, explains this season's Farmer's Almanac predictions. When I was reading it in September when it came out, it, it said cold and dry, and they, you know, they've been pretty bang on. You know, the cold snaps that we were experiencing in, in November and December uh, have been about uh, minus six to minus eight up here, so it's been great for making snow. Uh, but the natural snowfall, it's been dry. We haven't had it, and we're obviously getting it right now, so it's great. Uh, well, we're sitting, uh, you know, with a uh, huge amount of snowmaking uh, capabilities that we've made. We've made uh, enough snow to cover uh, 145 football fields with a foot of snow, uh, allowing for great snow conditions on about seven ski runs. Today, with this natural snowfall, we're trying to open Lions Express accessing Collins ski run. So, you know, as we get more snow, more natural snow, we open up more terrain and, and we'll continue to do so as uh, conditions allow. Raymond, how was your run? Really good, thank you. Honestly, the conditions up there, how are they? Great and finally better. I can't believe the uh, snow's finally arrived. Approximately how many runs did you are open? Are, are you skiing up there? About three or four at the moment. Been up here since this morning, got about 15 runs in, but uh, yeah, it's looking much better than it was the past few days. So you knew it was going to snow this morning and you made an effort? Yeah. I did, definitely. <laughs> How was your day? How was the skiing out there? This is my fifth day and it's definitely the best because this is the one with actual snow <laughs> and actual powder. It's so much better also than this morning. Like just every run out we're looking how it's accumulating and it's so good. How are you feeling though before this snowstorm? Really? Were you, were you a little bit worried, skeptical? I was super bummed because this is the first year I've been a pass holder so and the first year that I've had time to come up so I was really bummed but not bummed anymore, super happy. <laughs> Nothing but smiles and high hopes today at Cypress Mountain. Five Peaks Trail runner Solana Clayson is taking her skills to the snow this season as race director for the Yeti Snowshoe Series. I'm ready. All right, me too, let's All go. All right, here we go. Selena, why is snowshoeing just getting so off the charts popular? Well, Snowshoeing has become so popular because it's so easy to do. All you need is your running shoes and you can rent snowshoes at your local mountain equipment co-op, you can rent them at the mountain, or you can buy a pair and it's really affordable. Anybody who's interested, maybe they've tried snowshoeing recreationally, but are interested in possibly trying their first race, what advice do you have? Come out, 
and enjoy it. You don't need to own your own snowshoes. We rent them at a nominal fee. You don't need to have any experience. It's just about getting out there and having fun. We offer two course distances, so we offer a shorter course for newer runners and we offer a longer course. Mother Nature gives no guarantees. Powder is a privilege, patience is a virtue. We have so many amazing events still to come this season like the Yeti Snowshoe Race Series, so we need to keep our fingers crossed, stay hopeful and work with what we've got. If you do want to register for a race yourself, visit their website, theyeti.ca. And for all your local snow conditions and reports, visit playoutdoorsvancouver.ca. At Cypress Mountain, I'm Stephanie Florian with Local Connection. All that activity has really sparked our appetite, so naturally we've stopped by the award-winning Hawksworth Restaurant for a little ladies who lunch. Ladies indeed. Hawksworth Restaurant is known for its remarkable food and its eclectic clientele. And Sean, it just so happens we are about to join a pack of career-driven women who empower each other to follow their dreams over lunch. Bon appetit. Hello everybody, today I'm here with Maria Critico, CEO and founder of Ladies Who Lunch. It is a movement of like-minded women who get together to empower one another. Hi Maria, how are you? Hi Maria, how are you? Welcome I'm to great. the show, welcome to our Shaw TV studios. Thank you. And first of all, I want to say it's kind of cool, you don't always get to interview someone with your same name, Maria Maria. <laughs> so. We're starting off on a good note. So first of all, tell me a little bit in more detail, <laughs> what is Ladies Who Lunch? We are starting off on a good note. Ladies Who Lunch is a movement to inspire women to be fearless and fabulous. That's our tagline. Um, but it's really to help women realize their dream and to live it. And what is it that inspired you to start Ladies Who Lunch? Well, the group speaks to um, a few different uh, women, basically groups of women. The first group I would say is women that potentially have, like myself, have been through something very transformational, whether it be a divorce or the loss of a career or relationship, and life as they know it is no longer the same. They need to see other women that have gone through uh, what they are currently going through. The group essentially is a group of women seeking inspiration and other women that can provide the inspiration. Now, I understand that you put together these events and they have themes, like one of the recent ones, it was a secret to success. Yes. So explain, how is it that these events work? Well, basically how the movement works is uh, we inspire women currently through the series of inspirational networking lunches, where we basically, um, we have dynamic female speakers that share their story, usually their story of inspiration in different areas. So uh, the topics last year, we had three lunches. The first one was live your dream. And the second one was uh, setting goals. And the third one was the secret to success. I want to switch gears a little bit and I want to talk about the philosophy like behind it all. And on your website, you say this, real beauty in life is realizing and mastering your own power. Yes. So tell yes, me about that. That's very important, Maria, because um, a lot of women oftentimes feel that uh, they're not powerful enough to do the things that uh, they've always dreamed of. And um, it could be that maybe they think that I'm just a woman, I'm, I can't be as successful as a man. And don't get me wrong, I have nothing against men. <laughs> In fact, I love men. <laughs> I just said that on camera. But um, sometimes they feel that they can't be as successful or attain a, that, that certain level of power that a man has. And I want to show women that, yes, you can. So do not be held back by your limiting beliefs. Yes, you can attain that same level of success. Wow. So I want to teach them that they are the creators of their own life, that only they have the power to create their life in whichever way they imagine possible, really. So what is your goal, Maria? What do you want to achieve? Ultimately, what I would like to achieve, I mean, what do I want to be remembered for? What do I want my legacy to be is really, um, if I've inspired someone to take action, to change their life and to really live out their dream, that's an amazing goal, so. And now for all of those women that are out there who feel and are thinking like, I'm not good enough, I can't achieve my goals, what would you say to them? That's just a limiting belief. It's, um, 
is something that's holding you back. You can do anything. Anything is possible. If you believe that you can, I want to encourage women to go after their dream and uh, not get to the end in which they had. So be fearless and be fabulous. Fearless and fabulous. There we go. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Maria. I really appreciate it. Now you can follow at Lunch with Maria on Twitter. You can like the Ladies Who Lunch Facebook page and of course visit their website at www.ladieswholunch.ca. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Maria Rosso and you're watching Local Connection. You know, Steph, I'm always so inspired when I see other people making their dreams come true. Whether you want to be a TV host or a CFL football player, set your intention and make it happen. Absolutely. So speaking of inspirations, we're at the legendary BC Place Stadium, home to our very own BC Lions football team. And up next, we touch down on our health with CFL player Marco Iannuzzi, who shares his own story of how multiple sclerosis has affected him personally. Joining us on this Multiple Sclerosis Special Report is researcher Dr. Ellen Tremlett, who's an associate professor from the Faculty of Medicine at UBC. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. So what is exactly multiple sclerosis? Why does it occur at an early stage in one's life? And why that prevalence in women? No, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. So I guess it's uh, best to describe it as it's a, bra it's a disease of the brain and the spinal cord. Um, in British Columbia, the average age at onset of MS is, is 30, uh, 30 years, um, but there's a huge range. Unfortunately, we've even got young, young kids who can develop multiple sclerosis through to, to elderly people, but the average age is 30, and three quarters of the people uh, affected are women. So we think about one in 500, one in 1,000 people um, over their lifetime will develop multiple sclerosis. So there are a lot of people living with MS, about 75,000 in, in Canada. Canada is in the top five highest rated Western nations affected by multiple sclerosis. But not all parts of the Canadian population are affected in the same way. There is a significant difference in the rate of occurrence amongst Canada's general population compared to its Inuit population of the Arctic North, who virtually have no incidence of multiple sclerosis amongst them. Explaining why we are seeing these patterns, Dr. Tremlett suggests... Canada's not unusual in that respect. Um, we do think that the risk of MS is, is um, tied partly to genetics and partly to environment. Um, so in terms of, say, the, the Inuit, there's a genetic component there that may somehow either protect them from getting MS or doesn't make them as susceptible. Diet may also um, factor in. We believe that um, low levels of vitamin D um, or the sunshine vitamin um, might be associated with an increased risk of developing multiple sclerosis. Um, and perhaps their diet is higher in, in, in fatty fish, which tends to be higher in vitamin D. As for where research is in terms of finding a cure, I think to me the most exciting thing going on at the moment, there's one intervention study that's just started in Australia and they're looking at whether giving people at high risk of MS vitamin D supplements, if that will reduce their risk of developing multiple sclerosis. Um, it'll be still be a, a number of years before the results from those studies are available. And for her advice to those recently diagnosed or living with multiple sclerosis, is there hope? Absolutely, there's, there's a lot of hope, there's a, there's a lot of interesting research going on at the moment, um, but get out there and enjoy life. And someone who knows all too well about MS in the family is someone we all know quite well. He's a wide receiver for the BC Lions, a 2011 Grey Cup champion, but today it is his family struggles with multiple sclerosis since his mom's diagnosis that is putting a spotlight on this incredible athlete. It's Marco Iannuzzi. If you could share some of her story, how sure. she came to be diagnosed. Basically a biochemical reaction happened in her body where she was uh, put into bed, bed rest, and she couldn't really control her legs anymore. She was losing her vision. Uh, it was a very scary time, uh, especially for my father, who was now in charge of you know, being the ma major breadwinner of the family, as well as uh, taking care of two boys, and now he has to take care of his wife. It was a very difficult time. 
And although Marco was as young as three years old when his mom was diagnosed, the memories of her painful experience are still very raw for him today. I don't know if she came to terms to it to terms with it right away immediately. Um, like I said, I was young, so my memory of just her not able to participate in the things that we had previously done, that's all I knew. Um, the first time I really learned more about what MS was and sort of the realization of our family was when they sent the home nurse um, to start uh, teaching my mom how to do her own injections for her medication every day. And at that time, the, the nurse sort of explained what it was, and I can still remember sitting around the kitchen table, and um, yeah, as I think about it, it sort of chokes me up, but um, yeah, it was very tough. And it is this love and concern for a dear one that spurred Marco into action to do his part to help multiple sclerosis research. When we won the Grey Cup, we were all given uh, your day with the cup, do whatever you like. And I decided, well, I should do something more than just enjoy it with myself and my family and friends. I want to, you know, bring a better, you know, maybe help other people beyond that and, and gain some awareness of, of MS or, or uh, some other philanthropic cause. So I, I decided to support the Branch Neurological Foundation. We did the climb for the cup. We raced up uh, all 802 steps of the Calgary Tower with the cup. Um, we, we let the public and corporate sponsors, and we raised, I think, just over $20,000 that day. Wow, yeah, so it was, uh, like I said, it was a learning experience for me to understand what homeopathic remedies existed for MS, um, and also to help out a great cause that, that we really, it was close to me. That's a good block. As for the discipline that drives him to continue to be the successful athlete and person he is today, in spite of all the challenges. It is success that drives me, um, no matter what I'm doing. If I'm playing professional football or if I was even playing flag football on a weekend with friends, I, I want to win and I'm competitive. As for his advice for families living with MS. I think it, the key thing is just to go on and live your life. I mean you're gonna have new obstacles that you might not have otherwise had. But, you know, my mother still comes out to all these games. It's difficult for her to get into the crowd and walk up the steps and get to the seat, but it would be a lot easier for her to stay at home, but she still goes out and gets to the games and, and she, she lives her life. And I think that it hasn't stopped her for work. It hasn't stopped her from enjoying her grandchildren now. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things, it's, it's going to continue to digress until we find a, a cure. Um, and I think we are gonna find a cure soon. So keep your fingers crossed for the cure, um, but live your life in the meantime. What an inspiring story from a truly great guy. Visit the MS Society of Canada for resources and support for patients and their families, or if you'd like to volunteer to help. On this Multiple Sclerosis Special Report, I'm Lola Kala. Thank you, Lola, for that very touching story. And now we're going to switch gears. Stay tuned, because after the break, we're going to learn how to throw a great party. Hi, come on in. And for dessert, we indulge for a cause. Local Connection will be right back. Don't go away. I'm Bob Leonarduzzi. One in three Canadians know someone with Alzheimer's disease, the most common form of dementia. Dementia is not a normal part of aging. Family and friends are impacted and live with the reality of this disease, which to date has no cure. Don't drop the ball on your friends because no one should be alone on the dementia journey. Support the Alzheimer's Society of BC in their search for the causes and cure for dementia. Welcome back to Local Connection. I love the little girl kimono. Today we are shopping at Redfish Kids on Hornby Street to find some fun gifts for an upcoming baby shower. Absolutely. You know, Steph, it seems like everybody I know is having a baby these days. Sean, you didn't tell me you were in the market. Well, not that I'm aware of, but if I was, I'd be shopping here. Every little boy needs a pair of native boots. Oh, absolutely. Redfish Kids has party favors and gifts for kids of all ages. <laughs> And coming up next, our resident party planner, Amber, shows us how to take one baby shower from mediocre to magnificent. Today on Be My Guest, I'm helping Tasha, who's throwing a baby shower for her friend, Carolyn. Now, here's the thing. Carolyn's not really into traditional pink and blue, but she's a music lover. So goodbye, yellow duckies. Hello, rock and roll. 
I'm really curious to see what she's done with the place. When I was setting everything up, I kind of had this feeling like it wasn't quite Carolyn. I don't really have a lot of experience in throwing parties. I'm not sure she knows what she's doing. So, Tasha, big party day. Yeah. Tell me what you've done. Well, uh, basically I went to the baby shower aisle at the party store. I see that. And I picked up some streamers, because huh? streamers are festive. Egads. Okay, first off, the paper streamers. Really, with the exception of maybe like a Mexican fiesta, I never use them. I thought it would be fun to do a baby food taste test. Yum. If I have to taste baby food one more time, eh. In addition to baby food, Tasha's also serving up cheese and crackers and a grab and go veggies and dip, still in plastic. You wanna go out and buy some stuff that you can just take away. Awesome, but take it out of the plastic containers. Please use crockery. I mean, even if it's just like your basic plates you've already got in your cupboards, take it out of the plastic. Take it out of the plastic. Yeah, delicious. Delicious. <laughs> you've given me lots to work with. All right, similar to a construction site, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna demo it. Just because you're throwing a baby shower doesn't mean you have to limit yourself to the baby section of the party supply store. In this case, we know Carolyn loves music. So I put together a bit of a rock and roll baby shower scene. Let's get started. We've got a lot of work to do here and you got people coming pretty soon. Instead of that generic baby sign, we're hanging up these letters that I cut out myself with ribbon. Both are easy to customize to your party theme. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Streamers. Now, you use the paper ones that look really dollar store. What we're gonna do is we're gonna replace these with actual ribbon. Now, these are made with fabric. They're about the same price as the paper streamers, but they look so much nicer. I always have one of these at my house. Invest in a black tablecloth. It's a really simple backdrop, and we can dress it up with complimentary details. All right, we're gonna use the records now for serving dishes. They're nice, they're easy, and cheap. I've also pulled out some of the little white bowls. Again, it'll just look a lot nicer. Just because you're throwing a baby shower doesn't mean that you have to have a baby game. So I've put 12 different tracks on a CD here. Every single song has the word baby in the title. So all your guests have to do is sit back, relax, listen to the tunes, and try and figure out what the names of the songs are. The game is so much better. It's, it'll be a lot of fun. One last thing. We got little stars for our little rock star. <gasps> They're here. It's my favorite part. Hi, come on in. Hi. I've been to so many baby showers and they're all the same, pink and blue and ducks and everything. And this being a rock and roll theme with records, it's amazing, I love it. She knows me so well, I love music. The records, it looked so great when I came in the door, it's so me. Amber did a wonderful job revamping my party. It looked really cute and I'm really happy she came and helped out. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. My work here is done. Thanks, Amber. And now for our final story, the sweetest story yet. We're here at Bell Cafe, one of my favorite spots in town, and they're participating in this year's Hot Chocolate Festival with their signature banana split. Sean, let's follow reporter Blanca Bland into Chocolate Arts, where we can actually indulge our sweet tooth for a great cause. The snow may have disappeared, but the Vancouver Hot Chocolate Festival returns for its fourth year. With over 20 local chocolate makers and over 60 flavors to choose from, you and your sweet tooth can't miss out. I'm checking out Chocolate Arts on West 3rd to see what they're creating. Chocolate Arts lovingly prepares hundreds of delights daily, but it's our hot chocolate that's receiving some extra affection this month. We really strive to make the best product possible. We really try and put as much love into um, what we do. Around here, variety is key and combinations are one of a kind. So we have recently expanded and we now have a cafe portion which allows us to do something like the Hot Chocolate Festival, so this is our second year. I'm here with Cecilia right now and she's going to show us how to make a chocolate shot. Cecilia, what's the most popular flavor? The most popular flavor for the chocolate shots is probably the Madeira Polo. Oh, great. And so can you show us how to make one right now? Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> I'm 
about to try my first chocolate shot. So how, is there like a method to drinking this? What do people usually do? Do they take the entire yeah. thing? Well, some people just sip it because it is really rich. Okay. So. I'm so excited right now. <laughs> oh my God. That's so good. It's so chocolatey and it's like fluffy and... Huge variety of chocolates here. What's your more unusual flavor? Well, because I'm from the prairies, this is where I love. We have the Rhubarb Rhapsody. We've just really concentrated um, local organic rhubarb. We also have um, our lemon and basil. We take mere lemons. We reduce the lemon juice down. We also have a clientele. And so we do a vegan truffle that we base off of fruit purees. And if you're not vegan, you'll still enjoy this, right? Well, we get yeah. lots of people who buy them because they're interested to try them. And yeah. it's still a very enjoyable chocolate. It just is a little bit different. Absolutely, it's a, it's a great chocolate. Chocolate is sweet, but for Greg and his team, giving back to the community is sweeter. We just love doing things with chocolate, but then one, one great thing about the festival is that every year there's a different charity that's chosen. This year, proceeds will go to the PHS and East Van Roasters. Both organizations provide training and employment for women in the downtown east side. I believe that chocolate is a key to happiness. I'm a huge chocolate person. What do you think? Well, let me put it this way. It's certainly one of the components to the keys to happiness. It generally is one of those items that we can eat and enjoy all the time. This is so good. Oh my god, I can't get over how good it is. I'm Blanca Blandin in Vancouver for Local Connection. That completes today's city tour and this episode of Local Connection. If you've got story ideas, we want to hear about it. Follow us on Facebook, message us on Twitter, or go to our YouTube channel to watch past shows. For Local Connection, I'm Sean Ayers. And I'm Stephanie Florian. Thanks, Thanks for, for watching. watching.